Hello and welcome to day two of the forum. Thanks a lot for joining us. Yesterday, we found out plenty about the corporate debt overhang and investigated how shifts in inflationary pressures are affecting the outlook. Today, you can expect to hear more about how businesses are being affected by the pandemic, as well as how monetary policy is being affected by climate change and also um, inequality. We shall also announce the winner of the Young Economist competition. Just as a reminder, we'd very much welcome questions from you, the participants. In order to ask them, please raise your hand via Zoom. We are living through an era of vast change. The pandemic has funda fundamentally altered the way most of us work and widened the gulf between the economy's winners and losers. This next panel will investigate how different parts of the economy have been affected. I'd now like to introduce our session chair, the European Central Bank's Vice President, Louis de Guindos. Mr. de Guindos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Clara. Um... Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Prof Professor Chiara Griscuolo at the start uh, of this uh, second day uh, in, our, in our forum. This is going to be the first session of the second day. Our second day, as uh, Claire has indicated, uh, is going to be dedicated to structural changes shaping future economic developments. And our first paper focuses on the way in which the, the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, has affected productivity and business dynamics across the euro area. Chiara Criscuolo is head of the Productivity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Division of the OECD and has conducted extremely relevant research on these very topics, greatly advancing the use of firm level and micro data. She will present her paper on productivity and business dynamics uh, through the lens of COVID-19. Her work uh, has uh, a country-specific dimension and it can shed light on questions such as uh, which changes are likely to persist and which aspects will return to the status quo. And second, whether the move into more digitalization by widening productivity gaps could increase divergences across countries in line with uh, their, inter the, their industrial structure. Uh, Chiara, you have the floor. You know, it's housekeeping, you know, recommendations. You have 20 minutes. And afterwards, uh, we'll have uh, Professor John von Rinnen that will be your, your discussion. Chiara, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Let me start by thanking uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me. It's, it's a great honor uh, to be here with you today, even if only uh, virtually. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, mentioning uh, the uh, president of uh, the ECB, uh, Christine Lagarde, who remarked in her opening uh, speech yesterday that the COVID-19 has been a, re a recession like no other. And indeed, uh, what I'm going to show you in, in the next 20 minutes and what I've tried to show in the paper is that the COVID-19 has significantly affected uh, productivity and business dynamics in the short term, and it has the potential of significantly affecting uh, productivity and business dynamics in the medium uh, to long run. In, in, in the presentation, I will focus on, on the channels and in particular on four channels that might have affected uh, productivity and business dynamics uh, during the crisis. And I will start looking at the, uh, the first, uh, is, is at, the, at the reallocation uh, between uh, businesses that has come with the crisis, not only across sectors, but also within sectors, focusing also on the process of creative destruction. So entry and exit, that was already uh, mentioned yesterday in the session uh, led by Professor Ivashina. But the COVID-19 has also been a significant uh, change uh, for, for businesses. Uh, businesses to survive had to adopt uh, digital technology, had to uh, use uh, telework practices. And the comp 
complementarity of this digital uh, that adoption and telework with intangible assets will have uh, potentially long-term effects uh, for productivity, uh, business dynamics, but also inequality and uh, concentration. Before I, I move on and go into detail, let me uh, mention, uh, men let me note uh, two, two issues. The first one is that uh, one of the challenges I faced while, while uh, doing the paper is really the scarcity of timely and granular data that is uh, comparable across country with some notable exception in particular the safe survey of uh, the ECB and the surveys uh, led by the AB. Uh, so some of the uh, evidence will really rely on also on uh, country-specific uh, evidence. The second big caveat is I think everyone knows we are still not out of the woods yet. So we are very much still in the crisis and therefore it's still early days to really be able to clearly distinguish between what is a cyclical pattern to what is a structural change. So uh, this needs to be kept in mind when, when uh, interpreting uh, some of the results. With these two caveats in mind, let me move to the first uh, channel, the cross-sector reallocation. It's no surprise that COVID, uh, while affecting all businesses, has very much been a sectoral shock with sectors uh, that depended more on face-to-face -face interaction with customers being affected more. To show this, uh, let me uh, describe the graph reported on the slide where we rank businesses according uh, to their level of uh, labor productivity before the crisis. And if you focus on the uh, white diamonds on, on, on the graph, you see very clearly that the uh, sectors that have been most affected are the ones that have also the lowest uh, productivity. So it seems that there is a sort of pecking order in the strength of the shock which might actually uh, explain a productivity enhancing reallocation that was not present, for example, in previous recession and in particular in the global uh, financial crisis. This might appear as good news, uh, but actually this increase in productivity, which uh, in the euro area amounted uh, to 1.5% increase, uh, uh, you know, in 2020, actually came with a destruction in output. So we have seen a 6.3% uh, percent, uh, decline in output that really reflect the shrinking of the sector. And this hasn't been really uh, matched with an increase in output in, in, the, uh, in the high productivity sector. So this is actually bad news. The second big question and the headwind, I would say, is this might not be long, uh, a long-term uh, enhancement of productivity and evidence from the UK already suggests that there is a fading out of this productivity enhancing uh, role of reallocation or sectoral reallocation already at the beginning of uh, 2021. So how much of this will stay will actually depend on, on the uh, long-term change in consumer behavior. Finally, if, even if this were to stay, there are significant costs to cross-sectoral reallocations coming from for example, a skill mismatch and, and uh, friction such as uh, frictional unemployment. So uh, again, this is a, a sign and, and uh, I would say a push for a, an important uh, role for policy, in particular skill policy, if, if this continues. Let me now go to what has probably been the most striking and the most peculiar uh, feature of the uh, COVID-19 crisis, which has been an unaccepted uh, decline in bankruptcy. This was discussed at length uh, yesterday in, in, in uh, Professor Ivashina's talk. But you know what I wanted to show is that both in the Euro area, but in the UK uh, uh, also, there has been a strong decline in uh, bankruptcy, probably reflecting the effectiveness of the sizable uh, support uh, measures in place, but also the regulatory uh, measures that were put in place also uh, at the very beginning of the uh, COVID crisis that actually uh, delayed bankruptcies. The other side of the coin when we think about creative uh, destruction is entry. Entry actually uh, presents a bit more of a, a heterogeneous uh, pattern within the euro area. So let me start with what we see outside the euro area, uh, very strong uh, V-shaped uh, recovery in the US and the United Kingdom, mainly uh, pushed by the increase in entry rates in online uh, retail, and also some positive outlook with entry uh, entry level entry rates uh, 
going back to the levels pre-crisis, if not higher, for example, in the case of France, for uh, most of the euro area countries, but with two, I would say, significant exceptions, Italy and Portugal. This is where these are countries where entry rates are still uh, lower uh, relative to uh, pre-COVID uh, crisis level, and this might raise concern about continuing decline in business dynamics that we have seen, uh, you know, over the last decades, uh, you know, in the U.S. but also across Europe, and in particular the potential consequences of a missing generation of firm, something that we had already seen uh, after the uh, global financial crisis. Perhaps a big question uh, that uh, it's important to ask ourselves and, and, and to uh, answer is whether uh, the reallocation that we, as I said, has been uh, slowed down or delayed has been distortive or not. So one potential mechanism that might make the reallocation during this crisis uh, distortive is the fact that, uh, as I said, the, the shock has been very much a sectoral one and so it might have affected all firms, uh, independent of whether they were uh, profitable or um, or uh, productive before the crisis because of the significant liquidity shortfall that may, they may have uh, faced. Secondly, we also uh, mentioned the support measures, which for sure saved uh, job matches and made this uh, recovery uh, much smoother than we may have uh, expected, but they have also potentially, uh, they may have also uh, slowed down and, and distorted the reallocation process. Now, the evidence uh, from countries such as uh, France suggests that this has not been the case. Uh, in particular, a recent study by uh, Cross uh, and, and co-authors suggests that, uh, if anything, the support of the government has absorbed the sectoral na na nature of the shock. And evidence that was mentioned yesterday from the uh, Comité Quéré also suggests that the uh, support measure didn't disproportionately go to uh, businesses that were or could have been already uh, considered zombie uh, before uh, before the crisis. So, uh, you know, the risk of zombification doesn't seem to be there. And similar studies from other countries, the UK, uh, US, uh, Australia, seem to point to a similar direction. Uh, that said, I think it, it's important to uh, mention that I think in the next few months there will be a balancing act where governments will need to, tra to, to face the trade-off between continuing uh, protection uh, versus running a risk of distorting the economy. And as uh, President Lagarde said yesterday, you know, the support measure might need to be adapted and, and become perhaps more, uh, more surgical. Now, uh, perhaps let me get uh, to the uh, to what I think has been one of the most striking uh, changes uh, coming out of of, of this uh, crisis, and it's really the sudden adoption of of digital technology and and the fact that firms had to resort to telework practice to be able to continue operating. Now, one thing you could tell me is that you know, adoption of, of, of uh, especially process innovation and, and reorganization during crisis is actually something that is not new. Uh, you know, Aguillon and St. Paul already in 1998 uh, raised this issue and, and, and John, who is going to discuss the paper, has a very recent and, and nice paper on this. You know, the virtue of a crisis is actually that it lowers uh, the opportunity cost for firm to uh, reorganize and, and innovate. That's true also in COVID, but uh, for sure a peculiarity of COVID is the fact that it really forced firms uh, to adjust very quickly uh, the way they were producing, so uh, teleworking, uh, but also engaging with their customers, so really try to adopt digital technologies that allow them to, to move from offline to online. Let's think of e-commerce, e-payment, uh, and, and so on. And indeed, this has allowed, uh, in the short term, an increase in resilience that probably we hadn't expected. And uh, Eberly, uh, Haskell, and, and Meisen actually uh, use a very nice term, which I think the use of potential capital, which is very much the desks, uh, the uh, connection that we have used at home uh, during the last months, have been a great source of resilience, which probably, according to their estimate, contributed roughly 10% uh, of GDP. So let me start with, I think, uh, telework that has really been uh, uh, 
I would say the epitomization of, of uh, digital adoption and digital change uh, during business. As I said, it has been a great source of resilience, but it has also contributed to uh, output growth through uh, thanks to the savings uh, due to lower commuting costs. Uh, there are also uh, potential learning effects, uh, and, and given that the stigma of, of telework is now being broken, these benefits uh, coming from uh, learning to use digital tools uh, might actually continue uh, beyond the crisis, given the strong expectations uh, that we have uh, found in both managers and workers of a continuation of a hybrid mode of working. That said, uh, the link with productivity is uh, a priori actually uh, ambiguous. And, and, and let me stress uh, one uh, potential negative consequence of uh, long-term and, and uh, intensive use of telework, which is the uh, negative impact of knowledge sharing. And this might be thought of not only the ad hoc knowledge, knowledge sharing and in-person meeting, but also the serendipitous meeting that someone might have uh, around the coffee machine or even uh, going and buying a, a sandwich next to uh, someone's office. Uh, these are actually crucial uh, for innovation and are really, I would say, at the core of, of agglomeration economies and, and, and knowledge exchanges within a densely uh, populated area. Now, the potential risk is that both within firms, this knowledge sharing is diminished and this will lead to lower innovation, but also that across firms within cities, within metropolitan area, these, these exchanges uh, will be uh, lower and, and in a way lost. So this is to me uh, the, the biggest risk uh, from telework for innovation and productivity growth. The second one, and, and some of this has already been shown, especially in the US, is the fact that this might lead to increased inequalities, not only uh, across firms uh, and, and and amongst those who can telework and not telework, but I think the ones that might be affected much more are those uh, low-skilled workers who, whose livelihood really depends on white-collar workers who can telework continue going to the office. And these are the auxiliary services of maintenance and cleaning of offices, but also uh, those that provide amenities around uh, offices. In the paper, I go in, in, into much more detail about the potential implication of telework uh, on the role of cities, on, on, on real estate prices, and, uh, and also uh, state supply uh, pressures. I'm, I'm not going into uh, that here. Let me go uh, rather to, to really uh, discuss more in detail uh, the uh, potential scenarios that can arise uh, from this increase in digital adoption. So uh, the shock has really pushed uh, adoption of, of digital technology at a very fast pace. So we might see an initial drop in output due uh, to adjustment uh, to the new technology, but ultimately we should expect an increase in firm productivity. If this is happening uh, across the board in an equal and homogeneous way, then we should see an increase in catch up of uh, small and medium enterprises. We should see a closing down of the productivity gap between the best firms and, and, the, uh, and the sort of lagging firms. And we should see ultimately a lower wage inequality as this is very much related related to productivity dispersion. However, what we have seen during the crisis, and again, this is something that is not new, uh, and, and we have seen it in the past, larger, more digital, more productive firms who had the complementary investment, uh, the, the complementary intangible assets that are needed to benefit from this investment are actually the ones that were more likely to adopt and more likely to adopt multiple uh, digital technology, but also more advanced digital technologies. Now, this will give uh, uh, the uh, larger businesses, the, the ones with the larger market share, even more um, more of a lead because they will continue to benefit from uh, the intangible assets being uh, proprietary uh, software, being better management. And again, uh, John has done a lot of work on this, being, uh, you know, higher organizational capital. So the, the, the nature of intangible uh, make it possible for larger firms to benefit more because of the high sunk cost and the low marginal cost and the scalability of uh, these intangible and, and the digital uh, uh, assets. These will perpetuate, if not increase, uh, dispersion in performance uh, observed uh, pre-crisis. And, and I'm talking about increasing because 
we have also seen uh, at the beginning uh, that there might be uh, a reallocation of resources and increase in demand uh, for digital services coming, for example, also from the uh, switch uh, to uh, telework and, and deselling. So if that's the case, let me show you a, a figure here. Uh, if you look very much, if you compare the two panels in the graph, you see that uh, if I compare low digital intensity sector and high digital intensity sector, we see that the gap between the frontier firms, whether I look at globally or within European Union, and firms below the frontier is actually much larger in, uh, in digital intensive uh, sectors that notwithstanding the fact that the uh, let's say let's call them the rest or the lagging firms are actually seeing also a, a stronger I would say uh, growth or a stronger increase in productivity than a firm the lagging firm in non uh, in lower digital intensive search so suggest that there might be you know a positive uh, effect also for them from the um, from the COVID-led uh, uh, increase in digital adoption. Secondly, I already mentioned the link with the wage inequality coming from the fact that uh, the dispersion in, in, in uh, productivity is also very much linked with the uh, increase in wage inequality. Finally, and this is probably where I want to spend the next couple of minutes, it is really about the increase in markup and concentration that might uh, follow from this increase in adoption. Now, whether we want to call it market power or efficient reallocation, I think is very much an open question. And, and you know, recent uh, theoretical papers suggest that both might be uh, at play here. But let me focus just uh, on, on, on two, let's call them proxy for uh, either markup or efficient allocation, an increase in markup and an increase in concentration. Why do I think that this, uh, the increase in digital adoption uh, will increase the, uh, the average markup uh, trends that we have seen already is because again, this increase in markup has been much stronger in a uh, high digital intensive uh, sector, probably also reflecting, uh, as I said, the nature of uh, intangibility that I discussed, so high uh, sunk cost, low marginal cost. But interestingly, uh, what I'm showing here on the right hand side, on, on, on the right hand side panel, is the fact that when I look at the top of the distribution, it's very much firms already had very high digital markup that will continue uh, observing high markup, you know, if, if uh, digitalization continue. Let me now move to concentration. And one important thing to note is the fact that uh, the, we have seen an increase in concentration already in the last decade, and this increase in concentration was particularly strong uh, due, uh, during and, and after in the aftermath of the global uh, financial crisis, and especially for high digital intensive uh, sectors. Now, one way of, of trying to predict in a way, because we don't have data for concentration, is to look at one of the channels through which a concentration increases, which is uh, acquisition, merchant acquisition deeds. And what I look at on, on the right hand side of the, of the slide here is the share of uh, M&A deals, when, when I think in, in values, accounted for by deals where the buyer is actually a high digital intensive, uh, in a high digital intensive sector. What is striking is that this has increased, you know, already before the crisis, but has continued, and this is the only one who has observed growth during the crisis, this is the blue bar, by 75%, okay? so. This is quite striking. And, and let me perhaps show the last result, and then I'll move on to the last slide, is that why is this concerning is because this has happened, uh, the increase in, 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 in the value of, of m and deals has happened much more in industries that were already more concentrated, in, in for deals that where uh, the buyer was amongst the largest eight firms in its industries, and this was even stronger if we looked at digital intensive sectors. So that's why I think we need to really keep an eye on, on these trends, and, and this is why I think uh, competition policies and enforcement will be particularly important in the next uh, few months uh, and, and years. So let me uh, close uh, 
just by noticing that I think uh, monetary and, and fiscal policy have been key and crucial to ensure uh, resilience during uh, the crisis, but structural policy will become a strategic ally to really ensure uh, a recovery that is smooth, that is really uh, getting uh, to, to be uh, inclusive, digital and green. I've already mentioned the importance of skills to ensure uh, you know, a smooth uh, recovery and ensure the mobility of workers. Digital infrastructure is also shown to be very important. And I think uh, the uh, complementary investment in intangible assets also for uh, young and smaller firms need to be, uh, to be supported. Let me uh, let me stop here. Uh, one one point I would like to say is that yesterday Professor Ivashina really mentioned the uh, importance of insolvency regime. I, I fully agree with that, and I would also stress that in many European countries, the judicial system play also an important role. Let me close here and let me thank you uh, again uh, for for the invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Chiara, for, for this uh, very rich enlightening and comprehensive presentation about the changes that uh, uh, COVID has brought uh, to us. Some of them, uh, you know, will fade away, others for sure that, uh, you know, will stay for longer. Now, let me turn to our discussant, uh, Professor John Van Rienen. He's professor at uh, the London School of Economics. And uh, besides that, uh, John is also a digital fellow at the uh, MIT Institute for the Digital Economy. So he's in a very well, very, very good place to discuss your paper, Kiara. John, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share some thoughts on, uh, on this excellent paper that Kiara has just presented. Um, you know, I'd really recommend that you read the paper. It's incredibly comprehensive of almost everything uh, we currently know, I think, about the uh, impact of COVID on the, on the business landscape, particularly around uh, productivity in the euro area. Really recommended reading for uh, policymakers and, and, uh, and students. There's lots of fascinating empirical nuggets in the, uh, in the paper around what's happened over the last couple of years of productivity. So you know, as Chiara said, it's a you know, striking thing was in the first half of last year, productivity actually rose as although uh, output fell, hours worked um, fell by more than output, hence measured productivity increased. Uh, also, there was this interesting between sector movements. So more activity moved towards the kind of more productive sectors. Um, so, you know, away from retail towards say manufacturing. And then um, within um, sectors, although there was some slowdown of reallocation, it was still positive, um, the paper argues. And, uh, you know, it was better, you know, if you look at entry rates, for example, they've uh, uh, meant they, 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 they have been relatively high in the pandemic period compared to the global financial crisis where they, they fell a lot more. Um, furthermore, there's been this faster diffusion of certain types of technologies, like digital technologies and, and telework. Um, and interestingly, as the paper points out, these are stronger in the places which are already adopting lots of digital technologies. So this is going to actually increase the overall inequality between firms. And that is something which you know, Cara and her colleagues at OECD have pointed out. You know, I, I call this increasing differences between firms that you see in a large number of dimensions, productivity, markups, labor shares, and wages. And I, you know, I kind of documented this in a kind of Jackson Hole talk I gave a couple of years ago. And I, you know, I'm doing some work on detailed inequality review to show how that's, that's kind of continued. So I think these are all fascinating. But of course, you know, you've got me here not to just uh, congratulate Kiara, I have to say a few, a few uh, uh, things. So, you know, I, I'm just going to talk about the challenge. Four points I'd like to see develop more in the paper. These are already mentioned, but I'd like to bring them out and then end up with what I think is really required in terms of policy making, which is a growth plan uh, for Europe and more generally in the uh, developed world. So here's the challenge. We know this. This is kind of GDP growth. Right? Those of you who are old enough to remember the global financial crisis like myself were told this is a once in a lifetime horrible shock. In fact, we got another even more horrible shock last year. So you can see this is, you know, the, the, the hole that we're in, that we're trying to dig ourselves out of. But it's just as important to remember that the problems long predate the, um, the, the, uh, the, current, the current pandemic shock. So if you look at total factor productivity growth, the proxy, you know, for technological change since the Second World War in the Euro area countries, you can see that the pattern has been one of, you know, decline. 
So, you know, from the very fast post-war reconstruction, halving off the oil shocks, going further down in the 90s, and even prior, prior, prior to the financial crisis, um, these TFP numbers were very, very poor, so a third of a percentage point going into the crisis. And, you know, the U.S. had, you know, there was less destruction, so therefore less uh, TFP growth after the Second World War. There's also been a slide. And interestingly, you know, the, the era of the internet boom was much, you know, raised productivity a lot more in the U.S. than it did in Europe. And, you know, this, this, I'll come back to this as an example of how we need to make the best use of opportunities, especially in Europe, which we may not have done. Okay, so four points on, you know, I, you know that, I, uh, that I'd like to see a little bit more in the paper. So one of the analytical frameworks, Yukara laid this out very well, you know, this really goes through two of the big drivers of aggregate productivity, which is um, the kind of diffusion of new technologies and uh, reallocation, which is reduced, you know, potentially uh, reducing misallocation or increasing misallocation. I'd have liked to have seen a bit more on innovation. So, you know, you know how the crisis may have affected uh, frontier innovation growth, and Kara mentioned that a little bit uh, on the you know the impact of uh, the crisis maybe reducing uh, serendipitous creativity. So I, I like that. It, it, there's also a risk of cutbacks, I think, in terms of research and development. The, the lower demand, the greater uncertainty, reducing incentives to invest in R and D, the lower ability because of credit shocks and manual time diversion. So this may actually reduce some innovation at the frontier. So you know, there's a little bit of evidence on this. So I'd like to see a little bit more on this. Uh, and also, it's important that you know, in a way, it's the direction of technical change which has been influenced by the the crisis. And uh, you know, the overall level of um, diffusion may have actually decreased. I'll, I'll mention that in a second. Okay, second thing, measurement. Well, this is, you know, this is a bit of a boring point, but I think it's important. It's always hard to measure productivity. It's particularly hard in times of crisis, and it's particularly hard in, in, in COVID. Think of productivity, it's output per, per worker hour. You know, both of these are hard to measure. Worker hours particularly are tricky to measure given working from home and how heavily subsidized, uh, you know, we, we, we've had... Um, We've had through furlough schemes and other things. So I think it's, a, you know, it's particularly measuring TFP, I think, during the crisis, what people have done is, is really hopeless. It's so hard to measure capital inputs at the best of time. So I think we're hugely mismeasuring productivity. But even, I think, Cara brought this out, even if we knew precisely what happens to productivity, we, you know, how much does it actually matter? The key issue for me, and I think for policymakers in the, in the ECB and elsewhere, is, you know, what would happen, you know, when things start to return to normal? How much of the shock can be be recovered and I, I'm not you know I think that the measurement of what's happening now may not be necessarily a great indicator of you know, how we can return to a more more normal times okay third point of reallocation economists like myself love reallocation there's lots of reallocation going around offline online and so on but it's a bit of a loaded term so you know and Akira did, did mention I think it's really important so often we say well you know there's a decline of activity in low productivity units, whether that's industries or firms or plants. And that you know, looks good because you think, well, you know, these low productivity things should shrink. But if high productivity units, whether it's industries or firms, don't expand sufficiently to absorb the uh, loss of people, of hours and assets, then this is really waste. And this is, you know, you know, in some sense, bad productivity growth. You know, it's a uh, if you're de if you're destroying activity without creating high productivity activity, welfare is going to going to decline. So I think this is really important to uh, to bear in mind. And this balance between protection and reallocation, especially as we come out of the crisis, is very important. I think one of the lessons I hope we learned from the global financial crisis was that we moved in many parts of the world too quickly to austerity. Think about the UK. I think this is a classic example cutting back on public investment too quickly. And this is one of the reasons that, you know, we've also had particular problems in some countries uh, with, with poor performance. Finally, in terms of adoption, um, I think, you know, as, as Cara said, there's a lot of evidence that there has been greater adoption for digital technology and telework. Um, but we should ask the question whether it's efficient or not, you know. So it might, it may have been, you know, maybe it, it, it was efficient because companies prior to the crisis were not investing enough in, in these things. You know, there, there could have been a lack of experimentation. Maybe there were spillovers. Maybe there was a lack of coordination. So all those things may be true. 
and COVID false, you know, good things happen. But it, these may not be the case. And it may be that COVID has just really added to the costs that companies have to bear. And this is a kind of, you know, force of inefficiency. Another way of thinking about this is what about all the other types of non-digital technologies uh, have, the, you know, you could argue they haven't increased so much. So although COVID's twists the direction of technical change, it may not speed it up. In fact, it could have actually slowed it down. So I think that's a really important thing to think about in terms of thinking about the overall effects on, on uh, productivity. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more this within firm productivity change. You know, we, in fact, in the aggregate terms, within firm changes typically dominate between firm changes. And you know, it'd be nice to see a little bit more on the kind of firm level productivity changes. So my last uh, couple of minutes, I'd just like to say you know, what I think is the most important thing we should be thinking of in terms of post-pandemic policymaking. You know, in, in my view, you know, what I hope the pandemic does is actually change many of the ways that we have policies. And we have these tremendous challenges going into the pandemic. We had low productivity growth. And I think what we need is a, is a really ambitious thinking, a kind of a new Marshall plan for growth based around both innovation and the fusion of best practice. You know, this has to be based on rigorous evidence. I've, I've outlined this in some of my uh, particular things I've done with colleagues like Nick Bloom and Heidi Williams, and Daniel Skir. We tried to create these policy toolkits for how you would um, look at the evidence and try and evaluate it in terms of cost benefit and also time frame and inequality. Here's two toolkits we've developed for management on the one hand and innovation on the other hand. For innovation, I'd say, you know, Obviously, there's lots of things, but one thing I'm particularly passionate about is that we lose, in my view, in Europe and around the world, many of our inventors because we fail to actually remove the barriers for many underrepresented groups, whether it's minorities, kids from low-income families, or women, who could become the inventors and entrepreneurs of the future, the so-called lost Einsteins and lost Marie Curies. I think you know, there's many policies which we could think of as non-conventional in the policies towards innovation to reduce those barriers, which could increase our innovation capacity tremendously. The exact way we do this is going to depend on the country's conditions. I'd say we need to, you know, three key factors, balancing, protection, and reallocation, thinking about institutional reform to combat what I call policy attention deficit disorder, particularly around long-run investments. And I think we can bundle these different policies around innovation diffusion, around the climate mission, uh, in order to actually put these together in a way to actually create a new kind of growth plan. And you know, many people say I'm over-optimistic, this, this can't be done. You know, I think you know, one example where it did happen was after the Second World War when that huge negative shock galvanized policymakers around the world to create different growth plans and institutions, which enabled us to have, a, you know, for many decades, very sustainable productivity growth. So I, I think you know, it's, not it's not, you know, a, a historical necessity, but it is certainly a historical possibility. And it's one I think we need to, we need to seize. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, because for both of you, you have perfectly adjusted to the, to the speaking time, so congratulations in that respect. And uh, uh, thank you very much, John, for your remarks, for your thoughts, and for, uh, you know, ending up with uh, you know, an optimistic note that I think that is very important in life. So now, uh, uh, before we start to receive uh, questions, I don't know whether, uh, 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 Chiara, do you want to react? Huh? to, uh, you know, the remarks made by, by John. I mean, first of all, let me thank uh, John. I mean, his, his remarks are always uh, to the point and, and, and great. Perhaps let me uh, say two, two things. I completely agree uh, with the point he's making about the lost Einstein, and I think actually uh, the lack of infrastructure and the lack of skills in many countries might uh, transform the COVID in another uh, I would say, uh, fatality for, for, for lost Einsteins, because, I mean, one of the biggest, I think, fear in the long run, which I didn't mention, but is the consequences for uh, the generation of those who are now in schools or in universities uh, to really miss another opportunity to become, uh, you know, the next Marie Curie. Uh, let me be a bit feminist there. Uh, the second point uh, I wanted to make is the fact that um, I didn't look
look, it's true at, at frontier firms. Partly, this was driven from the fact that when I looked at uh, national accounts data and I look at the uh, intangible assets there, which I think are very much driven by investment uh, amongst the, the, the frontier firms, this has been very resilient uh, during COVID. I showed this in the paper and much more resilient at investment in intangible assets. Uh, the second, uh, I would say, op op the second pattern that made me uh, be a bit more optimistic about uh, frontier innovation and uh, is the fact that capital markets performed uh, remarkably well and that 25 uh, firms actually were the ones uh, that represented about 40 percent of gain in, in capital uh, in the market so again you know this suggests some good news. And finally, the, the mergers and acquisition trends to me show that uh, actually there are a few firms are still uh, quite strong. So, but I do agree completely on the direction of uh, technical change and the risk of duplication of efforts on, on, on digital technology. So this is something I will for sure include in the paper. So thank you. Thank you to John. Thank you very much, Chiara. Thank you very much, John, again. Uh, we have not received uh, any questions uh, so far. I, I suppose that they are coming. So, you know, I will take uh, advantage of my position as moderator of this, uh, of this discussion. And I, I would like to, to ask uh, a question to both of you. Uh, it's quite obvious that uh, uh, COVID is, a, uh, let's say, big major disruption huh, of the supply side of the economy. You, you have mentioned a lot of changes. Uh, perhaps, you know, this kind of changes do are, do they have any sort of impact on the way that we are modeling the behavior of the economy in the future? Uh, our present models that are the Inquisition models um, based on the Phillips curve, are they able to capture, you know, the kind of modifications and the kind of changes that COVID has produced in your view? Uh, that's a tough question, but uh, perhaps let me uh, let me mention uh, one thing, especially regarding the Phillips curve, is that one of the I think most striking feature of, of COVID is, as I said, the, the rise uh, of intangible assets, uh, the importance of intangible assets, and the rise uh, the rise of uh, digital uh, technologies. If, if this uh, continues uh, beyond the crisis, and I believe it will, it will flatten even more uh, the, uh, the Phillips curve. And, and, you know, in a way also, uh, given the, the, the rise in, in markups, it will weaken perhaps the transition mechanism, the way we see it of, of monetary policy. So this is something that I think uh, needs to be perhaps uh, considered uh, more closely in, in the models. The second, I think, is the rise of uh, wage inequality, which might also uh, sort of be a consequence of uh, of this crisis, both through uh, digital adoption and, and, and telework. So these are two things that I think need uh, further attention, I would say. John, yeah. I leave you the floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, 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 an, it's an excellent question. It's a very hard question. I mean, I think, I mean, you're pressing on the kind of performance of the you know, typical macroeconometric models, which you know, is used by the ECB and the Fed and, and, and general macroeconomic models. Um, and, you know, it's a well-known kind of issue, I think, with those models is that they don't um, really handle, you know, growth very well. Growth is, you know, more or less extremely exogenous to the whole modeling setup. And I think that you know, that's maybe a reasonable approximation for short spaces of time. But I think when we look over, you know, major changes in the economic structure, and when we think about the long run, the kind of growth, structural growth policies that I think are really important in, in you know, what will ultimately deliver improvements, I, I don't think they are really adequate. And I think we do need to, uh, it's hard, but I do think we need to think much harder about trying to build in how we think different uh, shocks affect growth effects. I think in macroeconomics for a long time, we've had this uh, you know, useful division of labor between people who think about long run growth and people who think about short run fluctuations. But I think that division has actually blocked us off from actually asking many of the important questions about how those two things interact, how short run shocks actually affect long run growth. And also, I mean, more importantly for me, how you can actually 
try and affect the growth rate. And this is the kind of very much the pretty baggy on view of the world, which I subscribe to, is that we don't need to accept we are in a permanent, you know, low, low growth situation. There are things that we can do about that. You know, research and development, innovation, food and diffusion, very much things the OEC talks about. So I kind of, uh, you know, I, I would um, push for some reforms, I think, of trying to enable our models to become richer to think about those effects. Thank you very much, uh, Chiara and John. And we have a first question coming from Elisabetta Sizova. And, uh, you know, I will read the question. Uh, in which ways did the pandemic change the competitive position of different companies? What could be implications for market structure and competition policy? Chiara, John? Yeah, uh, I mean, as I said, I think uh, the, the way the, the COVID crisis has uh, affected the market structure is that larger firms were already digital and were already in a good financial uh, position uh, before the crisis continue to maintain their advantage and if anything uh, also thanks to the mergers and acquisition that have shown have maintained and strengthened uh, their uh, their advantage so i think um, you know competition policy and, and competition enforcement need to be uh, particularly uh, sort of, I would say, on their toes in the next few months and really, uh, you know, antitrust policy need to be, uh, you know, to, to, to be, uh, I would say, enforced uh, very closely. The, the, second, uh, the, the second, I think, uh, important issue is the fact that uh, there might be new opportunities coming in, and that's where uh, startups uh, might play an important role. And uh, I'm thinking in particular, uh, when we look at the venture capital data, we see very much the increase in financing of uh, digital uh, technology, sort of remote uh, technologies that allow remote connections, but also the green. So that's where I think the government can play a role, either through uh, funds of funds uh, and public-private uh, partnership with venture capital, but also allowing uh, sort of the uh, level playing field uh, in these areas. So uh, that, that's where I see uh, things uh, moving. Yes, I think, I think this is a really important question which uh, Chiara also touched on. I mean, I think stepping back, it's worth thinking about these longer run trends of what's happened to uh, Western economies over the last 30 or 40 years. And you know, one of, I think as Chiara touched on, one of the most startling things that I noticed when I was looking at the data that people have noticed is that, you know, across a wide swathe of industries, you've seen increases of concentration, you've seen a generalized increase of, of markups. And, you know, that's been particularly strong in some sectors, as we know, like digital sectors. And, you know, you know different, diff there's different causes of that, and those are still, you know, under debate. I mean, I think one of the factors is clearly, you know, innovation and the generation of, of, of network effects through in many of the digital sectors. But I think all of us are concerned that given that rise of, you know, the, the kind of tech giants, the GAFAMs and, you know, other, you know, the Walmarts and the other kind of super, mega firms, superstar firms, that these firms are able to, you know, use the uh, power in ways which may be detrimental to consumers and to workers. And what's happened during COVID is that that strength has, has, been, has been tightened. So think about the digital sector, you know, this mass move to, you know, what we're doing now <laughs> on Zoom, on online platforms. Um, that, of course, has led to this amazing share price boom of, of, of companies which are, which are already, were already very, very powerful. So I think we do need to rethink the, the kind of competition rules. I mean, the, the principles, I think, are still right, but we need to reinterpret them to deal with the challenges that we face in this kind of new, um, the new era that we have. So I, I think it's, um, you know, there's, I've written, there's a lot of things written on this. Sean Schroll has an excellent uh, paper for this uh, Deaton review that I'm involved with. I, I think the way, the, broadly speaking, the way we need to change our competition policy is to think a lot more about future competition than past competition. The traditional way that um, that competition authorities do things, they look at the mergers, look at the market, existing market shares of firms. That's useful for a kind of old economy firm when you can tell if you've got high market shares, prices are going to go up. For new economy, you know, these, these type of industries where it's all about future competition, 
I think you have to take a much more forward-looking type of view. And the things that you're worried about are much more, well, you know, if this acquisition happens, is it going to weaken a future potential competitor to a dominant platform? So, you know, classic thing when Facebook takes over Instagram or WhatsApp, you know, could those platforms have been future competitors to this, this dominant platform? And, you know, we should, I think, be, you know, we should really put the, the burden of proof on the digital platforms to assure us that when this happens, that there's not going to be things which actually uh, entrench their market power further. So that's what, you know, that's one set of reforms we need, you know, as the European Union is doing or the Digital Services Act or the Digital Markets Act in the UK, we have to have a form of regulation which is kind of future looking. So not just dealing, you know, when there's a, a merger, but also thinking about how you create things like data interoperability and data portability to deal with the underlying kind of market power that these firms have and enable the kind of entrance that Kara is talking about to come into the market. So I, do, I, I agree that, you know, the ability of small new firms and small firms to enter and scale up is absolutely critical. And there may be lots of um, activities that the large firms do to, to kind of chill that. So we really do need to find ways in which we can reduce the risk that even if these tech titans have got to their positions through entirely competing on the on, 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 on the you know in, in a genuine way that in the future that this power is not being used in a way to to reduce competition and reduce productivity growth thank you very much i i, I am informed that uh, elisabetta is connected now you know i don't know whether elisabetta do you want to 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 add anything. Yes, uh, that's great. Uh, do you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, thanks, first of all, for a very well-structured and uh, comprehensive presentation and discussion. Uh, I have a small question, which maybe is uh, out of scope of the paper that was just presented, but uh, you mentioned inequalities and in, uh, in a sense that the productivity uh, shock can affect differently different groups of people uh, and in particular let's say females and males do you see it as a risk post-covid that for example inequality between men and women could actually increase and what can be a potential uh, policy response uh, to this challenge thank you thank you much thank you very much elisabetta so uh, th that's a very good question so uh, let me mention how uh, I sort of looked at, at wage inequality in the paper. So I think there is increasing evidence uh, both within countries and, and also from a recent study we, we have started at, at the OCD using much employer-employee uh, across uh, countries that one of the drivers of the increased wage inequality has actually been the increased differences in pay policy uh, for similar worker across firms. And we also showed that this between firm wage inequality is actually very closely related to uh, differences in productivity. So that's one source uh, that will drive, I think, the increase in wage inequality. About men and women, we also see in this recent study that there is some sort of uh, selection, I would say, of women in low-paying firms. And uh, in a way, you know, one, one option or one, one possible scenario is that telework will actually allow women not to select, you know, directly when they enter the labor market in, in the low-paid uh, uh, firms. However, one risk of telework, and again, this might uh, affect the progression of wages of women uh, within, uh, within firms, is the fact that uh, the, the women tend to be promoted less, you know, for, for various reasons, partly because they don't choose the most visible or they're not given the most visible uh, jobs. Uh, and so, and, and, and the second reason might be the fact that women are less likely to specialize still today in STEM uh, skills, which are particularly important in, in, a, in a more digital uh, intensive economy. See, all these reasons might suggest that actually women or the gap, the, 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 the gender gap in wages and, and the wage inequality of women uh, for women will increase after COVID. Now, these are all speculation. I don't have uh, the data to show this, uh, but these to me are all uh, potential reasons and, and that 
I would say, tend, tend, us, uh, tend to make us think that uh, wage inequality for women might actually increase uh, with, uh, with COVID. I don't know if Jonas looked at this more directly. I, 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 have, I don't know of any direct data on this. I mean, you know, you can see effects going in different ways. So one aspect of inequality, in addition to what Kara mentioned, is, is kind of young, young, young workers versus older workers. I think there's a, this, this is a really serious concern. So I think, you know, obviously, uh, as Kara mentioned, there's the kids who are going through school, like my daughter, and this has been incredibly disruptive. Um, but particularly for low-income young people who, you know, haven't got the same, you know, facilities that we have. So I think there's a huge learning gap, and I think there has to be a, a big investment in trying to help kids, especially from disadvantaged families, catch up with the kids from more advantaged families. So I think that's number one. And then when, when people go into the labour force, I think, you know, one of the ways that, you know, young workers especially learn is from informal interactions, you know, Kara was talking about, you know, the Serendus meetings, sitting in at new meetings, getting, getting help from other workers, getting training. That's much, much harder to do, uh, you know, when you're doing that, when you're working from home or doing that offline. And I do think, you know, that's a serious concern that the career progression of young workers is going to be much harder for the cohorts who are coming in during the, the, this kind of COVID period. So that I, that I think is a major source of inequality. And I think that also is relates to women as well, because I think the, you know, the progress that women have been making, which has been too slow, but the progress which has been made has been you know, through new cohorts of women coming in and being able to get up in the ladder within firms and move up the hierarchy. But, you know, that's going to be very hard to do without some of those more informal connections so that on the other hand you might say you know some people might say well maybe those informal connections have always benefited men more than women like you know going for a drink in, in the bar or the pub after work which women might not be able to do because of you know uh, child care burdens falling more upon them so the more formalization may cut in the opposite direction so there could be you know potential positives as well from from the change in the way we work but i think you know the, the, those would be the things I mainly worry about, but especially for younger workers, it's really going to be a you know, for young people. This is the COVID shock is really going to increase the inequality between young and old, which we're seeing in a number of different dimensions at the moment. Thank you, thank you very much. We have uh, time for uh, you know the last question. Uh, it's coming from uh, you know a colleague of you, uh, Chiara, Dan Andrews. Uh, Dan, you have the floor. Thanks very much. Kiara, a terrific paper, and um, thanks, John, for the discussion. Um, it's great as well. Question um, is sort of like, you know, I'd like to get your views on, like, what was the intrinsic nature of the COVID shock for market selection? So, like, you know, as you, as you know, like, a lot of OECD countries did some very unconventional things in terms of policies that prioritise preservation over reallocation, most notably through the use of job retention schemes. And... So one of the issues here is that we don't observe what would have happened without that policy intervention. And so I guess, you know, it could have gone two ways. One would have been that you would have had some sort of Schumpeterian cleansing dynamic here. And John talked a bit about that, and Chiara did. Or sort of the flip side, right, is you could have had some scarring effect, right, where you had some indiscriminate shakeout of product firms. Now, in terms of, like, work, my own work from Australia using administrative data, we see that the job retention scheme there, at least in its first phase, was more likely to protect high productivity firms and particularly financially constrained ones, which kind of raises the prospect that COVID may have been distortive and, and, and in a sense, policy may have actually worked to kind of, you know, correct that distortion. So would it be possible for you guys to talk a bit more about what we know about that, you know, particularly in Europe as well? I mean, Chiara, you go, you go, Chiara. I mean, I think that the most compelling evidence on this really comes from, uh, I would say, from France and, 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 and you know, partly also that there is a study that looks at Portugal where perhaps the outlook is not so positive. But let me, let me focus on France. And uh, I think here uh, the, uh, the evidence is that uh, support went to the, to the firms in need, uh, which might be the most financially constrained ones, not, not necessarily the most productive one. And, and I think, uh, you know, in a way that, that that is what you want. You want the firms that need support more uh, to be helped. Now, 
probably that's, uh, I, I know that the, in your case, in the case of Australia, I think that the support was much less generous in France. It was extremely generous. There were at least four uh, large support measures that were put in place. And I think the fear there would have been that the larger firms actually used, uh, or the most productive firm used all of these uh, support measure, uh, you know, more than, than those uh, that really needed it. And that is something that hasn't happened. So for me, uh, selection has really been very much in, in, in terms of needs, in terms of who has seen the largest uh, liquidity shortfall. And then the second, I think, criteria of the selection that we have seen uh, across, uh, across countries, but again, uh, quite strongly in, in France, is one, uh, a sectoral uh, need. So the sectors that needed support more were the ones that were targeted, which again is, is I think what you really wanted given the nature of uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, I don't know, John, uh, in the UK, I think the furlough scheme has also been quite effective probably. It's been effective of, of you know avoiding mass unemployment and you know the mass scrapping of assets. I think which is <laughs> which is a good thing. I, I think we have to you know again. I, I think you know my economists like myself love reallocation, but I think we have to be realistic. I mean, in the global financial crisis, um, a lot of the firms who went under were not the least productive firms, but they were kind of relatively productive firms, but who were financially constrained. So that actually you know is not good for <laughs> productivity at all. And I think that it, you know there was just mass support in in the in the COVID era. I think which was which was necessary. I, I think the issue is going to be as we come out of that, as we withdraw support, mm, yeah. what now happens and how we unwind that. There's kind of like in the UK, I think there's something like seventy billion pounds of uh, of debt, which uh, you know is outstanding. And I think a lot of you know we're going to have to face up to the fact that a lot of that is going to have to be written off so how we do that debt restructuring is i think going to be a major a major challenge in terms of thinking of unwinding some of these schemes if we do it too quickly then we're going to end up destroying a lot of you know valuable human non-human assets if we do it too slowly we're going to end up with a lot of misallocation so you know i think in terms of thinking about debt for equity swaps, thinking about many of the things we think about restructuring of debt in developing countries, actually, may be kind of tools we want to think very hard about, but it's going to face, you know, it's facing us very directly right now. Okay, thank you very much uh, to both of you, uh, Kiara and John. It has been extremely interesting. I think that it has been a very, a very rich discussion. I think that we have uh, covered a lot of, uh, a lot of ground. As John has indicated, uh, COVID perhaps is uh, one in a life uh, shock. I hope that over the next decades we will not have you know, a similar shock again, uh, uh, at least over the next two, three, four, five uh, decades. I think that uh, you have mentioned you know, a lot of implications in terms of productivity, in terms of uh, market power, in terms of, uh, of uh, equality. And perhaps you know, the, 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 the main conclusion is that uh, perhaps we had an economy pre-COVID and we will have a different economy post-COVID. And now, uh, well, uh, let's turn to, to Claire that is going to, to close this, uh, this session and to prepare for the next one. Claire. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Kiara for such a well-structured and wide-ranging paper and John too for drawing on some of the policy implications. What I really liked about this session was that you not only got a sense of how what we've seen during the pandemic has exacerbated trends we've seen in recent decades, but we got a lot of discussion of how now we're approaching some sort of normal, um, we need to adjust the policy measures that were put in place. And thank you very much once again to Mr. De Guindos for the second day in the row. You've gotten us off to a very strong start. We're gonna take a short break now. We'll be back at 15.15 Central European time. So please join us then.